Good morning. So far, we've investigated tensor ideas in two- and three-dimensional Euclidean space using Cartesian coordinates, also in special relativity using Minkowski coordinates. To get to where we want to be, we're going to have to come to grips with curved geometries, non-Euclidean geometries. We're going to do this in two steps. Step number one, we will remain in a Euclidean or special relativity type geometry, but we'll think about using coordinates other than Cartesian coordinates. This is going to make us have to think very carefully about what we're talking about. Imagine setting up a Cartesian coordinate system in the two-dimensional plane. I can think of a position vector as having components in the Cartesian coordinate system, x and y. If I include the basis vectors, I don't feel bad about writing arrow x is x times arrow i plus y times arrow j. If you look at the partial derivative of the position vector with respect to x in the first case and y in the second case, you get the basis vectors. To generalize our thinking, I'm going to define what we'll call a coordinate basis in the following way. E number beta is going to be the partial derivative of position with respect to coordinate number beta. Not all bases are coordinate bases. It's hard to see if you only know about flat surfaces and flat space-time how that will be, but we'll talk about that in a little while. Now, of course, we have a gigantic set of machinery that we've figured out involving basis vectors, components of vectors, basis one forms, and components of one forms, it's important to make sure that this new definition is consistent with the old definition. When we first started talking about vectors, we began by talking about components of vectors and then basis vectors. We figured out how the basis vectors transform, and the chain rule tells us in our new setting that the same formula works. If we wanted to write out all the details, we could write out that the components of vectors change in the way that we expect them to change. From there, now that we know all about basis vectors and components of vectors, we could talk about one forms and basis one forms, one form components, and what we'll find out is, if we carry the logic through, is all of our formulas still work. Obviously, some explaining is in order here. I'll take the unbarred coordinates, x1 and x2, to be Cartesian coordinates, x and y in the plane. The barred coordinates, x1 bar, x2 bar, will be the r and theta coordinates of polar coordinates. I want to figure out the basis vectors that go with these new coordinates. Something very disturbing is going to happen. In what follows, we're going to need to know some partial derivatives. In particular, I'm going to need to know the partial derivatives of the coordinates with respect to the other coordinates. Since x is r cosine theta and y is r sine theta, the partial derivatives of the Cartesian coordinates with respect to the polar are easy to figure out. The partial derivatives of r with respect to either x or y are easy enough to figure out. The partial derivatives of theta with respect to x and y are only a little bit more complicated to figure out. 
using the ordinary chain rule, x is our cosine theta and y is our sine theta. So I can write my position vector in this weird half mixed form. I'm expressing the components of the vector in Cartesian, except I'm using polar variables to do it. Also, strictly speaking, we should call this vector E1 bar. People will often, in introductory discussions, write that as E with a subscript of R, indicating that it's the coordinate basis vector that goes with coordinate R, which is terrible notation. This really should be written as E2 bar, but for the same reason people will often write it as E sub theta. Out of a mercenary sense, I may use this notation going forward. If I want to know the components of the metric tensor in these new coordinates, in polar coordinates, I could do this two different ways. Firstly, I could use our transformation law. This would be perfectly straightforward to do. It would also be sort of painful. Or I could remember what the metric tensor is supposed to be. Since I've gotten E1 bar and E2 bar written in terms of Cartesian coordinate basis vectors, it's easy to do dot products of these things. Doing these dot products is perfectly straightforward since we're using the Cartesian basis vectors, so we can easily figure out the four components of the metric tensor in terms of the polar coordinates. We already know how to write the polar basis in terms of the ij basis. It may be convenient for us to do this in the other order also. Remembering how to do the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix, I can write that i and j must equal 1 over r times this matrix times e r e theta. And lastly, it probably wouldn't hurt to know how to convert components of a vector from one coordinate system to another. Following the previously stated facts, it's not difficult to express v1 bar and v2 bar, colloquially vr and v theta, in terms of v1 and v2. We now have a huge variety of facts that connect one thing to another, so it's probably best to summarize them before we go on and look at some actual numerical examples that will show us how weird things have gotten. So, to summarize, this is everything we've figured out. This is more or less going to be enough information to let us get going on this tensors in curved coordinates business. Before we actually do that, though, I want to indicate just how bad this has gotten. Imagine that I have two vectors, u and v, when expressed in terms of Cartesian components, u is 3i plus 1j, and v is 1i minus 1j. The dot product is easy enough to figure out. It comes up equal to 2. What does this calculation look like if we do it in polar? It's easy enough to calculate the polar coordinate version of the u vector and of the v vector, in polar coordinates at the point of interest, the components of the metric are 1, 0, 0, and 16. Calculating g alpha bar beta bar, u alpha bar, v beta bar, I take the components of the metric, multiply by the corresponding components of u and v in polar. Because of these zeros,
only two terms amount to anything, giving me 3 plus negative 1, which is 2, which is correct. Now, a suspicious person might very well think that I carefully picked this point to evaluate the components of u and v at and the components of the metric at to magically make this work out. That's not correct, as we'll see in the next example. At the point where r is 5 and theta is pi over 4, it is a straightforward calculation to calculate the polar components of vector u at that point. They work out to be 4 over radical 2 and negative 2 over 5 radical 2. To calculate the polar components of v will be exactly similar. Doing the corresponding calculation, even though we're at a different spot, the dot product comes up the same. The components of the metric change, the components of the vectors change, but the dot product doesn't. Really, it can't. In this context, it's geometrical. It's the length of one of the vectors times the length of the other one times the cosine of the angle between them. This has to happen no matter which point you pick. The dot product comes up the same, even though all of the numbers involved need not be. I want to emphasize that this ER and E theta business form a coordinate basis. Two things about this. Firstly, ER, if you remember your calculus 3, we know that vector. That's a vector of length 1 that points directly away from the origin from the point x equal r cosine theta, y equal r sine theta. Secondly, if you do the ordinary Cartesian product of these two things, you end up with negative r sine theta cosine theta plus r times sine theta cosine theta geometrically e sub r and e sub theta are at right angles to each other. The first one, e r has length 1, but the second one doesn't. It's tempting to normalize it. At this time we must resist that temptation because it'll destroy everything we've worked so far to get. We'll talk about that more shortly. There is something really weird going on here, though. In Cartesian coordinates, when we form our basis vectors, I don't have to say I at point P or I at point Q or point R. Likewise, for the J vector, the reason that this is true is the coordinate axes are straight lines, lines of, say, constant x are parallel to each other, lines of constant y are parallel to each other, and because of the Euclidean parallel postulate, I can imagine drawing the start point for any version of i or j any place I feel like without any loss of ambiguity. In the case of polar coordinate basis vectors, though, life is not so nice. If I'm sitting here at point P, the cosine theta sine theta vector points directly away from the origin from point P. If I'm sitting at point Q, the first of the two basis vectors points away from the origin, all right, but it points away from a location of Q. Likewise, for any other point as well, these vectors are not equivalent to each other. 
They don't lie along parallel straight line directions, even though the length of each one of these is 1. For this particular coordinate system, the second coordinate basis vector, e theta, is also non-constant. It depends on where you're sitting at. Also, the length of e theta isn't even always 1. If a person wanted to be really, really careful, they would say stuff like er at point p, e theta at point p, or er at point q, e theta at point q, and so on. I've got to seriously warn you here, people don't do that. It's up to us to keep the context straight. There's a point that I want to make, and I'm going to try to make this very clearly. Imagine that you're sitting in the two-dimensional plane. You're using polar coordinates. You have located yourself at a point P and constructed the polar coordinate basis that goes with point P. Now, let's suppose that you're sitting someplace else. I'm sitting at point Q, and I make some other vector that starts with its initial point at point Q. Now, obviously, the most natural thing to do for the first situation is to use the basis vectors at point P. The most natural thing to do here is to use the basis vectors for point Q. The point that I want to make is this. In spite of all of this weirdness that we've been talking about today, we're still in a flat Euclidean plane. That means I could make a copy of E sub R at point P, but put its initial point at point Q if I felt like it. And I could do the same with E sub theta point P. I could write ER at point Q as some sort of linear combination of ER at point P and E theta at point P. I could do the same for E sub theta. So in a certain sense, I can add and subtract vectors still if they are located at different places. And again, this basically goes back to the geometry. The parallelogram law still works. Later on, we're going to find ourselves in a situation where that's not exactly true, but locally, it'll be more or less true. Imagine that you had a point P, and you looked at one of the basis vectors that goes with it, E alpha at P. You have a nearby point, Q, the coordinates of Q are the same as those of P, except X number beta has been increased by an amount delta beta. This quantity is a difference of two functions divided by how big the difference of the inputs is. If you take the limit of such a thing, this is what we usually call derivatives. So I'm going to define the partial derivative of coordinate basis vector number alpha with respect to coordinate number beta to be this limit. The relevance of the previous comment is this. This is a vector. It can be expressed in terms of the basis vectors at P. Then I divide by the scalar delta x beta. You might want to think about why that's a scalar. And then take the limit as delta x beta goes to zero. This is a limit of vectors. 
evaluated using the basis vectors at point P. In a vector space, every vector can be written as a linear combination of basis vectors. That is, the partial derivative of E number alpha with respect to X number beta at point P is a sum. It's going to be the sum of some coefficients times the basis vectors at P and then summed up. Obviously, I'm going to need an index of summation. I'll use the Greek letter mu as the index of summation. Since the basis vectors have their index downstairs, the mu will have to go upstairs on the coefficient. Also, I'm going to have to indicate which one of the basis vectors I'm differentiating. I'll write alpha as an index. Also, I need to indicate which coordinate that I'm differentiating with respect to, so I'll put an index of beta downstairs also. To make this a little bit more scholarly looking, I have to just adopt some letter to call these things. Traditionally, people use capital Greek letter gamma. The mu is going to be upstairs. The only remaining ambiguity is the order in which I write the alpha and the beta. People have adopted the convention, you write the index of the variable with respect to which you are differentiating last. So it'll be beta at the end and alpha before that. So being paranoid and writing in Evaluated at P, evaluated at P, evaluated at P. We say that the partial of E alpha with respect to X beta is gamma mu alpha at P, E mu at P. If people make it this far in studying the subject, then people feel as though there's no longer any need to be quite so explicit about things. I've been to try to be clear. So people just leave the evaluated at P off. These numbers, these gamma, mu, alpha, betas, are called the Christoffel symbols, and they're going to be of tremendous importance to us. The next task that we have to do is to figure out what these Christoffel symbols are, and then we're going to talk about doing derivatives of vectors, except this time we'll do it right. In the meantime, I hope everybody has a good day, and I'll talk to you again soon.